One, the hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Jill Robbins, John Russell, and Brian Lynn. Later, we will present the next part in our series on America's National Parks. But first, here is Jill Robbins. On the night of presidential elections in the United States, many Americans stay up late to find out who won. The reason? Most areas use electronic voting machines and computers to count up ballots. With electronic balloting, election results are usually reported on election night or early the next day. Because of the coronavirus pandemic and a move to mail-in ballots, it is likely that Americans will not know who won the presidency on election night. If that happens, some people are worried that U.S. President Donald Trump may not accept the results. Some state election officials recently warned that it may take days to count all the ballots that arrive in the mail. They must be mailed by Election Day, Tuesday, November 3rd. If the election is as close as it was in 2016, that delay may prevent news organizations from calling a winner. Jocelyn Benson is Secretary of State in Michigan and a member of the state's Democratic Party. She said, it may be several days before we know the outcome of the election. We have to prepare for that now and accept that reality. Ohio's Secretary of State, Frank LaRose, is a Republican. He has urged the public to be patient. We've gotten accustomed to this idea that by the middle of the evening of election night, we're going to know all the results, the Rose said. He warned, election night reporting may take a little longer this year. A few states already hold elections largely by mail. There, delayed results are common. But the results of a presidential election have not been in dispute since 2000. That year, problems with ballots in Florida led to weeks of chaos and legal appeals. Some election observers and Democrats worry about what may happen this year as the president criticizes mail-in voting. Trump is a Republican. He has claimed without evidence that widespread mail balloting will lead to a rigged election. It's very problematic, said Rick Hasen, a law professor with the University of California, Irvine. There is already so much anxiety about this election because of the high levels of polarization and misinformation, he added. Hasen is among the experts who have been studying how the pandemic may cause problems for the U.S. electoral system. He recently gathered a group of academics from both political parties to suggest ways to avoid having a disputed election. Some members have thought about possible events like state legislatures or governors refusing to seat electors or a candidate refusing to admit defeat. Since the pandemic began, many Americans have been looking for a safer alternative to in-person voting. Voters requested large numbers of mail-in ballots for presidential primary elections this spring. The state of Maryland will hold an entirely vote-by-mail primary on June 2nd. Election officials from both parties 
have supported calls for mail-in and absentee voting. Many states expect to be struggling to process millions more mail-in ballots than they usually do in November. Each state has its own rules for accepting and counting mail-in ballots. In some areas, mail-in ballots can be accepted several days after Election Day, but they must be stamped with a postmark before voting stations close. Some states count mail-in ballots as they come in, but others, like Michigan and Pennsylvania, have laws that bar processing such ballots until Election Day. That means the count will extend well into the next day. Another thing that could delay the count is that Democrats are pushing to require states to accept mail-in ballots postmarked on Election Day. Democrats have taken legal action, noting that the U.S. Supreme Court required it for Wisconsin's April 7th election. But because of that requirement, Wisconsin did not release results from its election until April 13th. Still, news organizations may try to predict a winner of the presidential election before the official vote count is completed. Those predictions are based on partial results, earlier elections, and studies of likely voters. Without enough information, the broadcasters may not be able to call a winner on election night. I'm Jill Huge bones have been discovered in a place 50 kilometers north of Mexico City, where a new airport is being built. Scientists, who study the past by examining very old objects, are digging up more and more of these bones. These archaeologists have found that the bones belong to the mammoth, the most famous mammal of a cold period in Earth's history known as an ice age. Archaeologists have found the bones of 70 mammoths so far. The latest discovery includes two large skulls, as well as rib and leg bones. Ruben Manzanilla is the lead archaeologist at the site. Manzanilla said that the place once was part of a shoreline with a lot of mud. Lakes likely formed there at the end of the most recent ice age. When an animal this size fell here, it got stuck and couldn't escape, he said. The mammoth bones belonged to a Colombian mammoth, which, unlike its relative, the woolly mammoth, had little hair. But it was a powerful creature. Manzanilla believes it weighed about 20,000 kilograms, and stood more than four meters tall. Many mammoths likely got stuck in the mud, Manzanilla said. But he said that evidence at nearby places suggests early human hunters used spears to kill the mammoths. They also may have used traps in the water. Over 10,000 years ago, Central Mexico had many groups, or herds, of mammoths. The bones they left behind led some people to create stories about giants. Lopez Luan wrote about some of the stories in the publication Mexican Archaeology recently. In 1519, two local kings showed the Spaniard Hernán Cortés what was probably a mammoth leg bone. They told Cortes that the bone came from terrible, tall men. Bernal Díaz del Castillo, a soldier and writer at the time of Cortes, wrote about the incident. We were sure there had been giants in this land, wrote Díaz del Castillo. I'm John Russell. 
Experts say just 26 words from a 1996 law have helped companies like Facebook, Twitter, and Google grow to the size they are today. The law is known as Section 230 of the 1996 Communications Decency Act. It is facing new attention and might be changed. It protects Internet companies from facing legal cases over things others place on their platforms. Under U.S. law, the companies are generally not responsible for things their users post on their websites. But last week, President Donald Trump pushed back against Section 230 with an executive order. The order says the government will reconsider protections if companies make editorial decisions about what users post. Trump's executive order came last Thursday, days after Twitter added what it called a fact-check warning to two of Trump's posts. Trump and other politicians say that Twitter, Facebook, and other social media companies have abused protections from Section 230. They have argued that the law should be changed or canceled altogether. Some experts suggest that the Internet as we know it today might change completely if the law were canceled. Here are some common questions and answers about the law. What is Section 230? An example might help answer that question. If a news website falsely calls you a cheat, you can bring legal action against the publisher. But if someone posts on Facebook that you are a cheat, you cannot bring a legal case against Facebook, only the person who posted it. The law protects companies which can have many millions of posts from facing legal cases brought by anyone who feels wronged by something someone else has posted. It does not matter if the post is true or false. Section 230 also permits social media services to remove posts that are obscene or violate what the service considers acceptable. In addition, the law requires the service to be acting in good faith. In legal terms, good faith means acting with honesty and fairness and without the desire to destroy the rights of a person or business. Where did Section 230 come from? The measure has its roots in the 1950s, when bookstore owners were being held responsible for selling books containing obscenity. Obscenity is not protected by freedom of speech rules in the First Amendment. One case on the issue reached the Supreme Court. The court ruled that it was unlawful to hold someone responsible for someone else's writings. The 1990s were years when the Internet experienced huge growth. Two companies operating at that time were CompuServe and Prodigy. They offered online forums where people could share information. CompuServe chose not to moderate its forum while Prodigy did. CompuServe was taken to court over its policy. That case was dismissed. Prodigy, however, 
got in trouble. A judge ruled that Prodigy exercised editorial control, said Jeff Kossoff. He wrote a book about Section 230 called The 26 Words That Created the Internet. Politicians did not like the judge's decision. They worried it would lead Internet companies not to moderate at all. And Section 230 was born. What if Section 230 is limited or goes away? Kasef told the Associated Press, I don't think any of the social media companies would exist in their current forms without Section 230. He said the companies have based their business models on being platforms for user posts. There are two possibilities of what could happen. Platforms might remove some of their offerings. The website Craigslist, for example, took down a section from its website after the 2018 passage of a sex trafficking law. The law created an exception to Section 230 for material that supports sex work. Craigslist quickly removed its personals section completely. The company did not want to take chances. Kate Ruana is a senior lawyer for the American Civil Liberties Union. She said that if social media platforms were not protected under the law, they would not risk posting Donald Trump's posts. Another possibility is that Facebook, Twitter, and other platforms could stop moderation altogether. Instead, they could let anyone post anything, good or bad. Services like 8chan, which is known for letting users post extremist images and messages, could then easily take control of social media, said Eric Goldman. He is a law professor at Santa Clara University in California. He said undoing Section 230 would be dangerous to the Internet. But Goldman does not see the administration's order as that kind of threat to the Internet. He said it is meant to appeal to Trump supporters. The president can't override Congress, he said. I'm Brian Lynn. Today, we visit one of the most famous national parks in America. You can find it in the Sierra Nevada mountains of the western state of California. It is one of the most stunning places in the country. Its name is Yosemite. Yosemite National Park is a place of extremes. It has high mountains. It has valleys formed by ancient ice that cut deep into the earth millions of years ago. Water from high in the mountains falls in many places to the green valley far below. There are 13 waterfalls in Yosemite Valley. One of these falls Yosemite Falls is the fifth highest on Earth. Up in the mountains are clear lakes, fast-moving rivers, and huge rock formations. One rock is called Half Dome. It rises more than 2,700 meters into the air. More than 60 kinds of animals live in the park. Deer are very common. You might even see a large black bear. 
and more than 200 kinds of birds live in Yosemite. In a place called the Mariposa Grove, visitors can see some of the largest, tallest, and oldest living things on Earth. These are the giant sequoia trees. One of these trees is called Grizzly Giant. It is more than 1,800 years old. It is almost 63 meters tall. At its base, it is 28 meters around. The old sequoia trees can make visitors feel quite small. The story of the Sierra Nevada mountains and the area that is Yosemite National Park begins about 500 million years ago, when the area was at the bottom of an ancient sea. Scientists believe strong earthquakes forced the bottom of the sea to rise above the water. After millions of years, it was pushed up into the air to form land and mountains. At the same time, hot liquid rock from deep in the earth pushed to the surface. This liquid rock slowly cooled. This cooling liquid formed a very hard rock known as granite. Years and years of rain caused huge rivers to move violently through the area. Over time, these rivers cut deep into the new mountains. During the Great Ice Age, millions of tons of ice cut and shaped the cooled granite to form giant rocks. Millions of years later, these would become the giant rocks like Half Dome and El Capitan in Yosemite National Park. Humans lived in the area of Yosemite for more than 4,000 years. The first people who lived there were hunters. Most were members of a tribe of Native Americans called the Miwok. A famous hunter and explorer named Joseph Walker passed through the area in the 1830s. He reported about the massive rock formations. In 1864, a United States senator called for legislation to give the Yosemite Valley to the state of California as a public park. The legislation said the valley should be preserved and protected. President Abraham Lincoln signed the bill. The event marked the first time that a government had approved a law to preserve and protect land because of its great beauty. The land was to be kept for the public to enjoy. Yosemite became the first state park. It was the first real park in the world. Then, in 1890, it became a national park. The National Park Service is responsible for the park today. Yosemite is about 320 kilometers east of San Francisco. The small roads leading to the park pass over lower parts of the huge mountains. Then the road goes lower and lower into the Yosemite Valley. Visitors to Yosemite Park can stay in several kinds of places. Beautiful old hotels are near the park. Some are very costly. Many visitors bring tents to Yosemite and camp in the park. Visitors can walk through the beautiful valley and the mountains. There are more than 1,100 kilometers of walking paths. Some short trails take only a few minutes to walk. Others can take days to complete. 
People come from all over the world to climb Yosemite's rock formations. The most famous of these is called El Capitan. Climbers call it El Cap. Climbing El Cap is only for rock climbing experts. It is difficult and dangerous. The climb is straight up the face of a rock wall. Most people take about three days to climb to the top of El Cap. Climbers must look for cracks in the rock. They place their hands and feet in the cracks and work their way up. They also use ropes and special equipment. From the bottom of the valley to the top of El Cap is about 1,100 meters. The climbers on El Cap must rest and sleep during the climb. They hang cloth beds or hammocks on the rocks. In 2015, two American rock climbers made history by becoming the first people to free climb El Cap's Dawn Wall. It is considered one of the hardest climbs in the world. Free climbing means climbing with little special equipment and ropes. It took them 19 days to climb all the way to the top. In summer, Yosemite Park is filled with visitors. Large buses bring people from San Francisco to spend the day. Other visitors come by car. Some even come by bicycle. About 4 million people visit the park every year. In the winter, heavy snow falls in the Sierra Nevada mountains and Yosemite. The snow usually begins in November. Heavy snow forces some of the roads into Yosemite to close during the winter months. The National Park Service works hard to keep most of the roads open. Winter visitors enjoy a special beauty at Yosemite. Many come to spend their time skiing at Badger Pass. It has a ski school for those who want to learn the sport. Some of the highest mountain peaks keep their snow until the last hot days of summer. But whenever visitors come to Yosemite, they experience great natural beauty in one of America's first. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.